All right, we're gonna have some fun today, hopefully. Um, how many of you guys filled out a bracket? A bracket? Anyone fill out a bracket? Does anyone love March Madness? I think it's like the greatest sport event all year. All right. Did anyone pick Virginia to win to win it all? <laughs> I totally did. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. I'm not alone in that. Man, my bracket is wrecked. But what else? Did anyone pick like Xavier to go far or UC or anything? Or did anyone pick Wright State? Was anyone like I think Wright State could do it? Okay. All right. Bold, bold man back there. Very nice. All right, so uh, this is the third week of our series on Lent called 40, and um, Lent is this 40-day period for us to give up something in order for us to identify with Jesus' suffering and his death. And so we're preparing our hearts that we can identify with the death of Jesus so that we can also identify with the resurrection of Jesus on Easter. And so we thought if Lent is laying something down, um, then Easter means picking up something new. Kevin quoted this, uh, I think, two weeks ago maybe last week as well. It's from N.T. Wright's book, Surprised by Hope. He says, um, of course, you need to weed the garden from time to time. Sometimes the ivy may need serious digging before you can get it out. That's Lent for you. But you don't want to simply turn the garden back into a neat bed of blank earth. Easter is time to sow new seeds and to plant out a few cuttings. If Calvary means putting to death the things in your life that need killing off, if you are to flourish as a Christian and as a truly human being, then Easter should mean planting, watering, and training up things in your life that ought to be blossoming and filling the garden with color and perfume and in due course bearing fruit. So God's kingdom redeems space. It redeems time. Today we're talking about how God's kingdom redeems matter. Um, I wish it would redeem my bracket, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, too late. Um, so what we're looking at today goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. It goes back to Genesis chapter 1 uh, when God takes chaos. Ooh, the stand is all right, falling on me. He takes chaos and he shapes it and he forms it. Um, there's darkness and there's waters. There's a deep sea of chaos. And God takes that and he shapes it into um, light. He shapes it into vegetation. He shapes it into um, land. And he shapes it into life. So God creates man in his image. In the, in the image of God, he gives them this command to go rule, to take um, the creativity that God has instilled in them and go uh, spread that throughout the world. Take the raw matter that God has give them, given them and take it and go shape something that reflects God's goodness like all of creation does. But sin happens and um, humans now have a choice. And so we have this choice to either create something that honors God or create something that honors ourselves, either worship or idolatry. Um, everything is either a tool to be used for building God's kingdom up or it becomes a trap that we then worship. And so one of the most obvious instances of this in Scripture is in the Tower of Babel. Um, people have figured out some engineering, some architecture, and they say, hey, let's build this really awesome tower. And it's cool, but they're building it to create a name for themselves rather than to worship God. It becomes an idol to them. And so that's kind of been the story of like our human existence thus far. We use our resources and our time and our work to reap a harvest uh, that worships us. And so instead of working to create something that honors God, we work and we create something that honors ourselves. We've shaped our tools, and then our tools have shaped us, and they've become traps. But then Jesus shows up and he brings this kingdom, right? This whole brand new thing called the kingdom, this place where God's space and our space are coming together as one. And what happens? People are healed People are fed, the poor and the marginalized are cared for, dead people are brought back to life. Um, Jesus redefines what generosity and leadership looks like when he says things like, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, or the greatest in my kingdom is the one who serves, or when he tells a, a wealthy young ruler that he needs to sell all his possessions and then come follow him. And Jesus also starts to um, change the way that we interact with God and saying that um, the way you interact with matter is also a way that you interact with God. And he says this in Matthew 25 when he tells people that whenever you um, feed the hungry, whenever you clothe the naked, whenever you visit a prisoner or you invite someone over to your house, whenever you share a meal with them, if you heal someone who is sick, whenever you do that to someone, you're doing it to God himself. It's an act of worship. So through interacting with physical matter, we interact with God. And so Jesus is the new Adam, right? He's living the way we're supposed to live. He's, um, he's ruling and subduing the way that we are supposed to rule and subdue. He's using matter to worship 
and build his father's name. He's using tools the way that they're supposed to use. Instead of allowing tools to shape him, he's using tools to shape the world around him. And so Jesus is crucified. Spoiler alert, three days later, raised from the dead. Um, and he invites everyone to believe in him and trust in him. And many of us have made that decision. We've made the decision to trust Jesus, but for some reason we've separated like the physical from the spiritual. It's a separate thing. We've made um, Easter and the resurrection only about the spiritual, but it's a lot bigger than that. And that's what this whole series is about. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. I love that. It's not like one day when you fly away to a spiritual um, realm, everything will be perfect, but for now you're going to have to suffer and things are going to be terrible for you. No, he's saying that there's a new creation that's happening right now in space, in time, in matter, in relationships. It continues in 2 Corinthians. He says, All this from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting them the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So it's an appeal. God is taking something that is existing now and he's changing it back. He's, he's reversing it. And he's doing it through us, through his ambassadors of his kingdom, through, through um, his people. Let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Let's get scientific, all right, because science rules. All right, what, who can tell me what all living things are made up of, made of? Can anyone tell me? Cells. Great job, guys. Great job. And other things, but cells, right? So you've got the membrane and the ribosome and the mitochondrion. That's the powerhouse of the cell. Um, you've got the nucleus and you've got the cytoplasm and all that good stuff, right? You all know that. Um, there's about 37, I think, 37 trillion cells in our body, give or take a few trillion maybe. Um, fact check that later. But what are cells made up of? What make up cells? Yes. Okay, DNA. Molecules. Molecules make up cells. Remember chemistry? You got these? Yeah, right here. You guys remember that. So you've got elements that are bonded together to make up molecules. Uh, there's about two trillion molecules in a cell. Really small. What makes up a molecule? An atom. You guys are great. You're good at this. Atoms. So atoms are like the basic unit of uh, a chemical element, right? They, they're protons, electrons, neutrons. They're so small. There are more atoms in a glass of water than there are glasses of water in the entire ocean. They're tiny, so little. What makes up atoms? How do you get atoms? Particles, all right? So these are the smallest units. I don't even have a picture for this one because they don't, they don't know. They're just tiny. They're the smallest particles and quirks, right? But they make, up, um, they make up protons and electrons and all that. So what happens when some particles come together and they decide they want to be friends and they bond together? What do you get? You get an atom, right? Particles bond together, you get an atom. And atoms have all the same characteristics that particles have, but they also have more. They have things, there's things in atoms that aren't in particles themselves. What happens when a group of atoms come together and they decide, hey, you want to hang out? And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And they come together and they bond. What do they form? Molecules. They form molecules, right? And molecules have the characteristics of atoms, but they also have so much more that aren't found in just atoms. This one's super tricky. What happens when a bunch of molecules get together and decide they want to hang out and they bond together? You get cells, right? We're going down and we're coming back up. All right. <laughs> you get cells. And cells have the characteristics of molecules, but they also have so much more. So it's not like just a group of molecules. It's a cell. It's an entirely new thing. All right, so what happens when a group of cells decide they want to hang out and they come together? They form us, right? Oh, dog tax. That's my little puppy scout on Christmas with our matching PJs. I wanted to sneak that one in there. But cells make up, yeah, all that, right? 
And we do have the characteristics of our cells. We have characteristics that our cells have, but we also have so much more than that. We are not just a group of cells together. We have personalities, and we've got different characteristics that make us all unique. So there's an obvious trend, right? It's like every time God brings something together, he creates something new, something more advanced that has the same characteristics as the old. And so if God is reconciling all things back to himself, if he's bringing um, all creation together, we're going to form something new that has the characteristics of right now. It has space and time and matter and relationships, but it's going to be something even greater and even better, and I can't wait. So God is redeeming everything. He's redeeming space and time and matter right now. Easter is so much bigger deal than we make it. If you took Christmas out of the Bible, you would lose two, three chapters, and that would be it. If you took Easter out of the Bible, you would lose pretty much the entire New Testament. John starts this Easter account by saying, on the first day, meaning that Easter is like it's the beginning of a brand new creation. It means that the life to come, the time when God's space and our space are united, that time has begun and it involves everything right now. So if Lent is a season to lay something down, um, to, get it, to give something up so we can identify with the suffering of Jesus, like it says in Romans 6, if we're identifying in his death and suffering, then we also identify in his resurrection. Um, then we should be picking something up, the new creation. So let's lay something down today. Let's pick something new up in our lives. So let's look at three areas, three tools where we uh, might have an opportunity to partner with God in this redemption of all matter, but we often drop the ball or we use those as opportunities to worship ourselves. So this first one is finances. Scary word. How did Jesus interact with finances? Well, we spoke about money and finances a lot. Um, he's, I think 16 of the 38 parables are about finances. Uh, and I think he did that on purpose because he knew how easily your finances can become an idol, how easily uh, they could become a trap for all of us. And I'm not saying that money or finances or resources are bad. They are great. They're a gift from God. They are a tool to use, but they can really easily become an idol and become a trap for us. So what did Jesus say about money? He said things like, sell all your possessions and give to the poor and then come follow me. Do not store up treasures for yourself. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus knows that it's, it's really easy to hold on to and worship our finances, but he's redeeming that. He's making things new. And so simply put, Jesus tells us that the way to redeem finances is to give it away and to be generous, to use um, our finances to forward God's kingdom, to bless people, to fix things around us that are broken, that need fixing. And so this isn't just a nice idea. This isn't just like cool, biblical, moral teaching. Um, this is, there's, there's evidence to back this. Richard Wilson and Kate Pickett, they're both epidemiologists in England. And so they, stay, they look at like tons of data. They look at structures and health and society. And they look at trends and things that affect how healthy people are, um, what people, are making people sick, what are, what's causing society to break down and all that. And that, so they just look at loads and loads and loads of data and find these trends. And they wrote this book in 2011 called The Spirit Level, where they looked at um, different countries. They looked at every first world country out there and they looked at the gap between their wealthiest people and their poorest people and how large that gap was between the wealthy and the poor. And what they found is crazy, right? If you live in a country where there's a bigger gap between the rich and the poor, there's shorter life expectancy for the wealthy. There's more people in prison. There's a higher rate of mental illness. There's more homicides and there's a lower literacy rate. And so countries that had smaller gaps, that had smaller gaps between their wealthiest and their most poor, had higher life expectancies, less people in prison, all this stuff. It's crazy. They used uh, England before World War II and during World War II as their example, um, as one example that they used. So before the war, there's huge gap. There's royalty, there's old money, there's extreme wealth, there's extreme poverty. The nation, there's like a whole spectrum of wealth in England before World War II. But the war happens, and it needs funded, and it needs supplied. And so people start going to work, and they start going to war. They start supplying and funding this whole effort as a country, right? They're all working together, and that gap narrows a considerable amount. And so while their kids are out fighting and dying, while their cities are getting bombed on a regular basis, life expectancy went up. The quality of people's lives went up because that gap shrunk. It's insane. 
But hear this, I'm not saying, I'm not making a statement or advocating for socialism or government redistribution of wealth or anything like that. I am not saying that. This is just how the early church worked. This is how they functioned. They had everything in common. They claimed nothing for their own. And when they saw a need, they met it. They sold their possessions or helped some, whoever had this need. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't worry about your stuff. Seek first the kingdom. It's like Jesus is speaking directly to us here today. Saying, guys, lay down your fear and trust God. Chase after the kingdom with your lives. And God will provide everything else that you need. So the truth is, God is making all things new. He's making space, time, time matter, relationships. He's making all these things new, and he's already begun that new creation on Easter. It's not something we're hoping for. It's not an investment that we're hoping pans out one day in the future. It's already happened. So lay down your fear. God is making all things new, and he's going to provide. This is awesome. So through the resurrection, God is redeeming finances, but you have to give them away. You have to be generous if you're going to redeem finances. So how are you worshiping God with your money? How are you um, using your finances to fix what's broken in the world around you? Are you looking for places where the kingdom is breaking through, and are you using your resources to further that? So the second thing is meals, all right? There is just something spiritual about sharing a meal with someone. I can't say this for sure, but it seemed like Jesus really liked to eat. Like the dude knew a good meal when he saw one. But even more, he knew a good opportunity when he saw one. Aside from miraculously feeding, you know, thousands and thousands of people with some fish and bread, why do you guys think people accuse Jesus of eating with sinners? Probably because he ate with sinners. And it wasn't just like a one-time deal or he did it one time and they're like, oh, my gosh, right? He did that all the time. Um, the, he pro- it's, you know, he ate with sinners all the time. He sought out opportunities for people that needed love and they needed to feel accepted and they needed to hear the kingdom and he, like, used those opportunities. Look at the Zacchaeus encounter. I was told never to do this as a kid. Jesus invites himself over to this guy's house for a meal. <laughs> he's like, hey, you, you're making dinner tonight. I'm coming over. And he's like, oh, all right, whatever. That's so rude. <laughs> but Jesus does it confidently and he's like, hey, I'm going to come over, right? He loved to eat with people. He knew that this guy needed the kingdom in his life, and so he saw this opportunity to, um, to, yeah, to share that with him. One of my favorite things to do with students, with high school students, one of the most effective things to do um, is to go out to eat with them. We go out like almost every Sunday night, and it's amazing when we roll in and take over an IHOP for a few hours, and the kids love it. We could play like five hours straight of laser tag and then go eat afterward, and all the kids would talk about throughout the next week would be about the meal that they ate. For some reason, it just like clicks with kids. It's crazy. I mean, they are like growing hormonal teenagers, and they're like, you know, it's a bottomless pit in here. But they just love this thing of eating together. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know that there's a better way to connect with a teenager um, than sharing a meal with them. It breaks down barriers. Parents, if you want to connect with your kids, Take them out to dinner one-on-one and let them choose where they want to go and listen to them and just let them be themselves for a while. Some of the first matter that uh, Jesus redeems in the new creation is communion. So Jesus takes this meal that used to represent Passover. It used to be the defining moment for a people group and an event that would pave the way for the Messiah, reflecting on the lamb whose blood on the doorpost saved them from destruction. And Jesus takes this meal and he opens it up to all people. He opens it up to all people and says that he's the lamb of the world and that you don't have to fit in to belong at this table, a table where you won't be judged by your bank accounts or um, your accomplishments or your skin color. Jesus even tells us to make sure that everyone's taken care of before you come and eat at this table, a table that says we are in this together and there is a new creation happening right here and right now. Don't be embarrassed, but how many of you are over the age of 40? Let's see a show of hands. (laughs) Okay, raise your hands if you just lied in church and didn't raise your hand. <laughs> Some of you guys, okay, I'm just joking. Um, I don't, I'm not over the age of 40. I'm not over the age of 30, so I don't know what that's like. But um, <laughs> if you are over the age of 40, you've had probably around 200,000 meals or more in your lifetime. We all have about 21 meals a week. And I know we're busy, right? I know you've got practices and rehearsals and base community and family time. And so you have no other choice sometimes but to, like, chuck chicken nuggets back at your kids in the car to get them to shut up, right? Like, you got to do that sometimes. But could we redeem our tables for the kingdom? Could we 
um, redeem our meals for the kingdom? What if your table became the one place where you and your family felt welcomed and felt valued and felt heard? Um, what if we could use food like Jesus did to break down the walls that people have put up, that we've put up to hide ourselves? What if we intentionally started sharing meals with people and using those safe places to open up to one another? We've got 21 meals a week. Invite our friends, invite our neighbors, invite our coworkers um, to our tables and let these people know that they're not alone. Let them know that we're in this together. Let them know that they're worth our time and let them know that the kingdom is here. So open up your table to your friends, to your family, to your base community, to strangers. What? Seriously, you want to do something awesome? Invite some, find someone who has nowhere to go for Thanksgiving this year and invite them to share that meal with your family. It's incredible. So this might be a little awkward at first. You might be thinking, I do not have the time or the margin to do this. Um, but you do, and it's totally worth it. Lay down your fear and pick up trust and trust that God's presence will be there in that meal and at that table. And the last thing is harvest. So Gallup Research did a study in 2013 where they looked at how people feel about their jobs, how they feel about the harvest that they're working towards. 13%. 13% said they're engaged in their job, meaning they find some sort of satisfaction. Maybe it's just a little bit, maybe it's a ton, but 13% of people find some sort of satisfaction in their work. 63% um, of people said they're not engaged at all. I'm just not engaged in my work. I just do that. It's just something I do. 24% say that they're actively disengaged. I'm not even sure what that means, but it doesn't sound good, right? <laughs> I'm actively, like, trying to not be a part of what I'm doing right now, right? But that's a quarter of us, right? I've felt that before. Anytime I worked in retail, I was like, man, what do I got to do to get out of here, you know? <laughs> but that totally makes sense, right? Because our work is cursed. God creates humans and he commissions us to work, to go create something and make order. And so work at its core is like a godly activity. Anytime that you take something raw and out of order and you form something and make it functional, you're doing godly work. So whether you're an engineer and you're working on like a new airplane part or you are um, making a sandwich, you know, or you're renovating a house and taking something that's broken and making it functional, that is, uh, that's godly work. And we've created some really cool things as a species, right? Did anyone see the SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch? Did anyone see that? It was so cool. We have a little video clip up here, I think. Look at this. That's incredible. So cool. We've done some awesome stuff, right? We've harnessed electricity. We've, um, we've built cars and airplanes ooh, and toilet paper. We've created football, which is also becomes an idol for me sometimes. But we've created football. We've created cell phones. We've created Thai food. Come on. Yeah, come on. We've done some really awesome stuff. Not to brag, but we have. But on the other side of the spectrum, we've also created some really terrible things. But the majority of us probably live somewhere in between, right? We don't create anything specific. We simply exist. We work our jobs that we don't like because we need a paycheck to support our family and our needs and our wants. Um, we're not creating anything good. We're not creating anything bad. We're just going through the motions of life. And so regardless of where you are, the curse is that you live, you work, Maybe you create something pretty cool like toilet paper and you make a little bit of a name for yourself, but then you die and that's it. And so all of humanity is working until things break apart. But guys, God is redeeming that. God has invited us to contribute to his work of making all things new, to partnering with him and um, taking things that are out of order and broken and turning them into something functional and beautiful. No longer working for ourselves and our own glory, but contributing to this new creation. What better calling, what better vocation could there possibly be? So working to find significance, working to prove yourself, working as a means to get a paycheck, we're freed from all that. If we are Christ's ambassadors, our work should be seeking broken things and bringing them into order. And I'm not saying that we all need to quit our jobs and go be missionaries, you know, in somewhere else in the world. That's not what I'm saying. But through the resurrection, our, our intent should be different. To quote N.T. Wright again from um, Surprised by Hope, he says, We should be going straight from worshiping Jesus in church to making a radical difference in the material lives of the people down the street by running playgroups for children of single working moms, by organizing credit unions to help people at the bottom of the financial ladder find their way to responsible solvency, by campaigning for better housing and against dangerous roads, for drug rehab centers, for wise laws regarding alcohol, 
for decent library and sporting facilities, for a thousand other things in which God's sovereign rule extends to hard, concrete reality. We should be leading the charge in health care, um, in education, and equality, and justice. The people who believe in the resurrection should be the people with the most love, and the most patience, and the most generosity. We should be speaking for those who don't have a voice. We should be caring and healing the broken and damaged and abused and enslaved in our world. So what would happen if we all surrendered um, our will and picked up God's will? What if we stopped working to glorify ourselves and instead we started contributing to the redemption of the material things around us? What would happen if we no longer worked just for a paycheck and instead uncovered the gifts and passions that God has given us and then used that to worship him? What if we laid down our lives for the old creation and started living in the new creation? This is not a burden. This is an adventure. God's redemption of all things isn't something that we're just hoping for down the road. It is here now, and it's redeeming all matter and space and time and relationships. God is giving us opportunities every single day to play a part in this. So let's lay down fear and let's pick up trust. Let's lay down our kingdoms and pick up God's kingdom. Let's lay down our identities and pick up the image of God. Let's lay down our stories and pick up God's story. And let's lay down the old creation and pick up the new creation. Have you ever felt like you're on the outside? Like maybe you're not good enough, successful enough, intelligent enough, pure enough, just enough. Like there's never a seat left at the table for you. Maybe not even a scrap. I did. And I wasn't the only one. See, I was one of many unwanted outcasts at the table the night that I met Jesus. Some of the others had decided to follow him, but I just wasn't sure. But throughout this meal, we could overhear the local religious leaders just tearing down the disciples, tearing us down, wondering why they would be sitting with us. They were saying things that we knew were true. We were unworthy, the lowest of the low. And none of us looked up for fear of catching a disapproving eye from one of them. And there was nothing we could say to defend ourselves. See, our safety relied on existing silently in the shadows. But Jesus wasn't silent. He was confident and bold. And even though speaking up for us and dining with us robbed him of any influence he could have had with those leaders, he was giving us new life. And it was as he'd said, he came for the sinners, not the righteous. And my heart was pounding inside of my chest and my breath was quick. We had waited patiently for this king and had he heard our cry. Was this the man that they believed would come? I was growing cautiously optimistic. So I would go with him, and I followed him from village to village, city to city, and people were swarming around, he and his friends, each day, just desperate to graze his robe for the chance, the brush of blessing it may provide. And one morning, we saw Jesus and his friends out at sea, and we rushed ahead, persevering through the crowd and the heat. And when they arrived, we could see that Jesus was exhausted, but he didn't pass us by. He told stories and healed for hours upon hours, never breaking for rest or for food. And before we knew it, dinner time had all but passed us by. Now there was talk of sending us home, and as I prepared for the journey, suddenly there was a shift in the crowd, and excitement was buzzing. And I turned to see bread being passed between friends and strangers, and fish too. I took a small piece just like the people beside me, just hoping that everyone would get some. But the meal kept coming. The baskets continued to make their way throughout the crowd. I had a first helping and a second, and parents were stacking food in their children's arms to carry home. And there wasn't a single person among us who didn't turn left and right, wondering where this supper had come from, and it was only a few minutes before we heard the news of God's miracle, that he had taken this small lunch from a generous child to fulfill all of us. We erupted in faithful praise and joyful laughter and thanksgiving, and as God rained his abundance down on us, we danced in it. 
And it went on this way everywhere that Jesus went. See, nothing in his path was left untouched or without grace because his presence was healing the sick and the weak, the damaged and disturbed, and feeding the hungry with feasts. We were experiencing a new reality, and we were provoked, knowing that life could be radically different. He was sending demons packing, bringing wellness to the sick, anointing people's bodies and healing their spirits. And as for us misfits and outcasts, he was providing a sense of belonging for the very first time. With him, we felt like we were home. The kingdom of God was unfolding right before our very eyes, and the news of these kingdom glimpses was spreading. Holy moments, like a prostitute, uninvited, in a Pharisee's home, raining tears upon Jesus' feet and using her hair as a towel, kissing his feet and anointing them with the most expensive possession she had to offer, her perfume. And the Pharisee grimaced in jealousy, disgust, and fear, because if the seats at the table were for people like her, where would he sit? Or even a moment like calling a tax collector out of a sycamore and into salvation. See, that's what he was doing for all of us, loving us enough to meet us exactly where we were, but too much to leave us there. And as Jesus continued his journey toward Jerusalem, he left evidence of his kingdom in every city until finally we were right outside of Jerusalem where thousands had gathered for the Passover feast. And we could tell tensions between the followers and the Pharisees were rising, but not even the threat of Jesus' arrest could affect the movement that had begun. And it had been a long journey, so with only two miles left, we were curious when we saw Jesus sent the disciples for a donkey and its colt. And it wasn't until some of their clothes were laid across the colt and Jesus rode upon it that we remembered the prophecy of a lowly and gentle entry of the highest king. Earnest seekers and followers flooded to the path where Jesus was approaching, and in moments the murmuring crowd was swelling into a boisterous and celebratory parade. But even in their hurry, they didn't show up empty-handed to meet our king, grabbing branches from the trees and some of us even taking our cloaks to lay down. We'd made a humble welcome mat for a humble king. Our ancestors had passed on the promise that this day would come, and it was finally here. The waiting was over. And we were approaching the Mount of Olives where mothers, fathers, and children, believers, and non-believers alike gathered, sharing and listening to stories of his ministry, some questioning who he was and what was happening, others infuriated at the response that he'd had. But there wasn't one among us able to deny his powerful, demanding, and graceful presence. Shouts of Hosanna began to ring out, and even my zealous cries were swallowed in an overwhelming roar of praise. Appeals and cries for deliverance and wholehearted, full-voice worship filled the air and space around us. But when I looked to the sidelines, I could tell our joyful tune had struck, struck the wrong chord with the Pharisees. They demanded that Jesus silence us, and we eagerly leaned in to hear how he would respond. And he simply said, but if they were silent, the stones would shout out. And they were shouting. We could feel it. In the void of praise from skeptics, they were crying out not to substitute missing worship or complement existing worship, but just to worship. Just as we were exclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna, not out of obligation, but as a result of our very nature, this instinctive and unrestrained response to God's Son. And in this worship, we weren't only recognizing our King, but we were lifting our voices in harmony with the rocks and hills, the flowers, and the stars. But in our enthusiasm, we didn't notice for several moments that Jesus had approached the edge of the mount and was overlooking the city. His shoulders were convulsing, and there weren't just tears. There were these great howls of distress for those who turned away, those refusing to acknowledge God's visit. He was grieving and mourning over those not experiencing, those rejecting the new life he'd come to bring, the new life we'd seen him give to withering bodies, prized perfume, common palm branches, financial fraud, limited portions. And knowing his presence would continue to reclaim the world one step at a time, we waited in awe to see what he would do next. <laughs> 